Hi, welcome back to Church Institute Manuals. Today we'll be going over May 22nd through the 28th Come Follow Me curriculum, which includes Joseph Smith Matthew chapter 1, Matthew 24 through 25, Mark 12 through 13, and Luke 21. So we'll just read the manual and I'll keep my commentaries to as minimal as possible. I like to just read through, so if that's what you're in for, if that's what you like, you're at the right place. If you're looking for somebody else's ideas and commentaries, there's lots of other channels on YouTube for that kind of stuff. So here we'll just start in Matthew, Joseph Smith Matthew, and this mostly talks about the document itself, and then in the next chapters we'll talk about the doctrine that it covers. So if you don't if you're not interested in the history of this chapter, probably just fast forward maybe five to seven minutes or something. What is Joseph Smith Matthew? Joseph Smith Matthew is the Joseph Smith translation of Matthew 23, uh, verse 39 through chapter 24, verse 51. For December 1st, 1831, Joseph Smith wrote the following note in his journal. I resumed the translation of the scriptures and continued to labor in this branch of my calling with Elder Sidney Rigdon as my scribe. This is a most important comment because it reveals how the, how the prophet himself viewed his work of translating the, the Bible. It was part of his divine calling as a prophet of God. In December 1831, the prophet had been at the translation some 18 months and would continue working with it for another 18, 18 months. After that, he would refine and prepare it for publication for the remaining 11 years of his life. Although he did not live to publish the entire work, it was the most unusual translation of the Bible ever attempted and stands as one of the witnesses to the world of Joseph Smith's mission as a prophet of God in the last days. When did the prophet Joseph Smith translate this portion of the Bible? The exact date on which the prophet started to translate the Bible has been lost to history, but the translation was probably underway as early as the summer of 1830. On December 7th, 1830, the Lord commanded Sidney Rigdon to become the scribe for the prophet Joseph Smith in the work of making the inspired changes to the Bible. Prior to his crucifixion and resurrection, the Lord Jesus Christ answered his disciples' questions about his glorious second coming. On March 7th, 1831, the Lord revealed to the prophet Joseph Smith portions of what he told his disciples. In that revelation, speaking to the prophet Joseph Smith, he said, Quote, and now behold, I say unto you, it shall not be given unto you to know any further concerning this chapter, Matthew 24, until this New Testament has been translated. And in it, the Joseph Smith translation, all these things shall be made known. Wherefore, I give unto you that ye may now translate it, meaning the New Testament, that ye may be prepared for the things to come. For verily I say unto you that great things await you. With that direction, the prophet began the next day, March 8, 1831, the work of translating the New Testament beginning with Matthew 1. The date written on one of the manuscripts of the New Testament translation indicates that on September 26, 1831, the transcription and refinement of Matthew continued starting with Matthew 26, verse 1. The translation of Matthew 24 may therefore have occurred sometime during September 1831. What are some of the changes the prophet made to Matthew 24? The prophet Joseph Smith made more changes to Matthew 24 than any other chapter in the New Testament. Matthew 24 in the King James Version contains 1,050 words, while Joseph Smith Matthew contains 1,500. A major difference between Matthew 24 and Joseph Smith Matthew is that Joseph Smith Matthew clearly separates the statements Jesus made concerning events that would take place in Jerusalem in the years shortly after his death, from the events that would take place in the last days, prior to his second coming. Three statements are each repeated twice in Joseph Smith Matthew, but only once in each of the King James versions. Also, verses 6 through 8 of Matthew 24 become Joseph Smith Matthew verses 23, 29, and 19, respectively. The Joseph Smith translation of Matthew 24:55 is the only verse for which there is no correlating verse in the King James Version.
How did Joseph Smith Matthew become a part of the Pearl of Great Price? The first edition of the Pearl of Great Price was printed in Liverpool, England in July 1851. It was compiled as a pamphlet for use in the British mission by Elder Franklin D. Richards, a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles and president of the mission. In the preface to the pamphlet, Elder Richards explained that nearly all of its contents, which included Joseph Smith Matthew, had appeared earlier in various church publications in the United States, but with limited circulation. It is presumed that Elder Richards had access to these publications. However, he did not identify any of his source documents. Why, among the many parts of the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible, did the translation of Matthew 24 become a part of our standard works? In Joseph Smith, Matthew 1, verses 5 through 55, the Savior answered questions his disciples asked concerning the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, the scattering of the Jews, and events that would occur prior to his second coming. It is a chapter of scripture that should be of intense interest to every Latter-day Saints. It tells of the Latter-day dispensation, including the gathering of Israel prior to the second coming of Christ. The text of Matthew 24 in the King James Version has many unclear passages, and its organization is confusing. The Joseph Smith's work makes both the historical chronology of this prophecy and the doctrinal significance of its teachings plain and inspiring. Right now we'll go through Matthew 24 and 25, which is chapter 8 in the manual. It says, Introduction and Timeline for Matthew 24 and 25. Chapters 24 through 25 of Matthew contain what is sometimes called the Olivet Discourse, so named because the Savior delivered it on the Mount of Olives. After spending much of the final week of his mortal ministry teaching at the temple, Jesus looked back on the temple and its surrounding structures and prophesied, I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Peter, James, John, and Andrew later approached Jesus privately with two questions. One, when shall these things be? Referring to the destruction of the temple. And two, what shall be the sign of thy coming at and of the end of the world? In Matthew 24 and Joseph Smith Matthew, you will study the Savior's response to these two questions. Comparison of Matthew 24 and Joseph Smith Matthew. After Jesus prophesied the destruction of the temple and the, and the city of Jerusalem, his disciples asked him two questions. In Matthew's account, it is sometimes difficult to determine which question Jesus answered in which verses. However, the changes found in the Joseph Smith translation of Matthew 24, known as Joseph Smith Matthew and the Pearl of Great Price, clearly separate the answers to the two questions. The Savior's answer to the disciples' first question about the destruction of Jerusalem is found in verses 5 through 21, and his answer to their question about the second coming and the end of the world is found in Joseph Smith Matthew, verses 22 through 55. Destruction of the Temple and of Jerusalem. As described in these verses, the Savior prophesied that the temple in Jerusalem would be destroyed, a prophecy that was fulfilled about 40 years later when the Jews were fighting for freedom from the Roman rulers. In AD 70, after months of intense fighting between the Roman army and Jewish rebels, the rebels took courage within the walls of Jerusalem, and the Romans laid siege to the city. The famine and hunger that followed were so severe that some resorted to cannibalism. Any Jew caught trying to escape was crucified in front of the walls of the city for all inside to see. The Jewish historian Flavius Josephus described the destruction and violence that occurred when the Roman army finally broke into the city and set the temple on fire. While the temple blazed, the victors plundered everything that fell in their way and slaughtered wholesale all who were caught. No pity was shown for age, no reverence for rank. Children and gray beards, laity and priests alike were massacred. Every class was pursued and encompassed in the grasp of war. There were the war cries of the Roman legions sweeping onward in mass. The howls of the rebels encircled by fire and sword. The rush of the people who, cut off from above, fled panic-stricken only to fall into the arms of the foe. You would indeed have thought that the temple hill was boiling over from its base, being over everywhere one mass of flame, but yet that the stream of blood was more copious than the flames and the slain more numerous than the slayers. 
In the end, the magnificent temple was destroyed and has not been rebuilt since. Josephus estimated that 1,100,000 Jews perished in the conflict. What is the end of the world? Part of the second question that the disciples asked the Savior included the phrase, the end of the world. The, Joseph Smith, the prophet Joseph Smith explained the meaning of this phrase while commenting on the parable of the wheat and the tares. Quote, According to the Savior's language, the end of the world is the destruction of the wicked. The harvest and the end of the world have an allusion directly to the human family in the last days, instead of the earth, as many have imagined. Thus, the end of the world is not the end of the earth, but the end of wickedness. Take heed that no man deceive you. Many of the Savior's prophecies about the destruction of Jerusalem can also apply to our day, when we are preparing for the second coming of the Savior. The Savior taught that false Christs and false prophets would arise and would deceive many, if possible, including, as recorded in verse 22, the very elect, who are the elect according to the covenant. The term elect refers to those who, God, who love God with all their hearts and live lives that are pleasing to him. In some instances, it refers more specifically to baptized members of the church. President Harold B. Lee taught that according to the covenant means members of the church of Jesus Christ. Much of what Jesus taught in the Olivet Discourse was to prepare his disciples both then and now so they would not be deceived and overcome by evil. President M. Russell Ballard of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, while commenting on these prophecies made by the Savior, cautioned church members not to accept unauthorized teachings. As apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, it is our duty to be watchmen on the tower, warning church members to beware of false prophets and false teachers who lie in wait to ensnare and destroy faith and in testimony. Today we warn you that there are false prophets and false teachers arising, and if we are not careful, even those who are among the faithful members of of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints will fall victim to their deception. President Joseph F. Smith gave wise and clear counsel that applies to us today. We can accept nothing as authoritative but that which comes directly through the appointed channel, the constituted organizations of the priesthood, which is the channel that God has appointed through which to make known his mind and will to the world. And the moment that individuals look to any other source, that moment, they throw themselves open to the seductive influences of Satan. Whenever you see a man rise up claiming to have received direct revelation from the Lord to the church, independent of the order and channel of the priesthood, you may set him down as an impostor. Remaineth steadfast. The Savior taught that in the perilous times that were coming for the Jews in Jerusalem, those who remained steadfast would be saved. This teaching applies to our day as well. Elder David A. Bednar of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles defined what it means to be steadfast. A person who is steadfast and immovable is solid, firm, resolute, firmly secured, and incapable of being diverted from a primary source or mission. A building or structure that is stable and immovable must be built upon a strong foundation. If you and I desire to become steadfast and immovable disciples of the Master, we must build appropriately and effectively upon him as our foundation. As we become more spiritually mature and increasingly steadfast and immovable, we focus upon and strive to understand the fundamental and foundational doctrines of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. Disciples who are steadfast and immovable do not become fanatics or extremists, are not overzealous, and are not preoccupied with misguided gospel hobbies. What is the abomination of desolation? The Bible dictionary helps us understand what abomination of desolation means. Daniel spoke prophetically of a day when there would be the abomination that maketh desolate. That says Daniel 11.31 and Daniel 12.11, which says, An arm shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. And uh, chapter twelve eleven says, And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. It says, and the phrase, the phrase was 
recoined in the New Testament times to say the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Conditions of desolation born of abomination and wickedness were to occur twice in fulfillment of Daniel's words. The first was to be when the Roman legions under Titus in AD 70 laid siege to Jerusalem. Speaking of the last days, of the days following the restoration of the gospel and its declaration for a witness unto all nations, our Lord said, And again shall the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet be fulfilled. That is, Jerusalem again will be under siege. In a general sense, abomination of desolation also describes the latter-day judgments to be poured out upon the wicked wherever they may be. And so that the honest in heart may escape these things, the Lord sends his servants forth to raise a warning voice, to declare the glad tidings of the restoration, lest desolation and utter abolishment come upon them. And that references DNC 84, 114 which says, Nevertheless, let the bishop go unto the city of New York, also to the city of Albany, and also to the city of Boston, and warn the people of those cities with the sound of the gospel, with a loud voice of the desolation and utter abolishment, which await them if they do reject these things. Stand in holy places. Elder Bruce R. McConkie of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, referring to the events leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, stated that the council that the saints should then stand in holy places meant that they should assemble together where they could receive prophetic guidance that would preserve them from the desolation of the day. Modern scriptures refer to the standing in holy places uh, President Ezra Taft Benson noted that today, holy places consist of our temples, our chapels, our homes, and stakes of Zion, which are, as the Lord declares, for defense and for a refuge from the storm and from wrath when it shall be poured out without measure upon the whole earth. References DNC 115 verse 6 that says, And the gathering together upon the land of Zion and upon her stakes may be for a defense and for a refuge from the storm and from the wrath when it shall be poured out without mixture upon the whole earth. While serving in the presidency of the 70, Elder Dennis B. Neuenschwander similarly noted, for Latter-day Saints, such holy places include our homes, sacrament meetings, our and temples. Much of what we reverence and what we teach our children to reverence as holy and sacred is reflected in these places. The faith and reverence associated with them and the respect we have for what transpires or has transpired in them make them holy. Flee into the mountains. Prior to the Roman siege of Jerusalem in 1870, Christians living in Jerusalem remembered that the Savior had warned, Then let them who are in Judea flee into the mountains. And they fled to a city called Pella in the northern foothills of the Jordan Valley. Though the Jews living in Jerusalem experienced starvation and eventual destruction during the Roman siege, those who heeded the Savior's warning safely escaped. The Savior's prophecy recorded in Matthew 24, 16-22 refers both to the Great Tribulation suffered by the Jews in AD 70 and to the Great Tribulations in the latter days. In AD 70, things became so bad that if the Lord had not intervened and shortened those tribulations, the Jewish people would have been annihilated. The Lord's intervention will also be necessary in the last days in order for his people to survive. If possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Joseph Smith Matthew 1, 21-22 signals the transition from events associated with the destruction of Jerusalem to signs that will precede the second coming and the pre preparation the saints must make to remain faithful during the last days. Many of the Savior's warnings on the Mount of Olives were given to help the elect avoid being deceived during this time. The phrase, if possible, suggests that if the elect are going to avoid being deceived, they must keep their covenants and hearken to the word of the Lord. President Russell, M. Nel uh, Russell Ballard shared an experience illustrating how a church member overcame deception. Well, one of my fine missionaries who served with me when I was the mission president in Toronto came to see me some years later. I asked him, Elder, how can I help you? President, he said, I think I'm losing my testimony. I couldn't believe it. I asked him how that could be possible. 
For the first time, I have read some anti-Mormon literature. He said, I have some questions and nobody will answer them for me. I am confused and I think I'm losing my testimony. I asked him what his questions were and he told me. They were the standard anti-church issues, but I wanted a little time to gather material so I could provide meaningful answers. So we set up an appointment 10 days later, at which time I told him I would answer every one of his questions. As he started to leave, I stopped him. Elder, you've asked me several questions here today. I said, now I have one for you. Yes, President. How long has it been since you read from the Book of Mormon? I asked. His eyes dropped. He looked at the floor for a while. Then he looked at me. It's been a long time, President, he confessed. All right, I said, you have given me an assignment. It's only fair that I give you yours. I want you to promise me that you will read in the Book of Mormon for at least one hour every day between now and our next appointment. He agreed that he would do that. Ten days later, he turned to my office, and I was ready. I pulled out my papers to start answering his questions, but he stopped me. President, he said, that isn't going to be necessary. Then he explained, I know that the Book of Mormon is true. I know Joseph Smith is a prophet of God. Well, that's great, I said, but you're going to get answers to your questions anyway. I worked a long time on this, so you just sit there and listen. And so I answered all his questions and then asked, Elder, what have you learned from this? And he said, Give the Lord equal time. May we engrave that thought on our minds and carry it with us as we walk through this process of mortality. Let us give the Lord equal time. See that ye be not troubled. Some of the events that will precede the second coming, including... Wars and rumors of wars sound ominous, but the Lord counseled, Be not troubled, for all I have told you must come to pass. This counsel teaches that the signs of the times need not bring us only fear, but they can also provide assurance that the Lord is in control and that prophecy is being fulfilled. During a time of economic and social turmoil, when many people were troubled about the future, President Thomas S. Monson encouraged Latter-day Saints, quote, Though the storm clouds may gather, though the rains may pour down upon us, our knowledge of the gospel and our love of our Heavenly Father and of our Savior will comfort and sustain us and bring joy to our hearts as, as we walk uprightly and keep the commandments. There will be nothing in this world that can def defeat us. My beloved brothers and sisters, fear not. Be of good cheer. The future is as bright as your faith. Wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. The Savior taught that one of the signs of the times would be the establishment of his church and the gathering of the saints to it from around the world. And now I show unto you a parable. Behold, wherever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. So likewise shall mine elect be gathered from the four quarters of the earth. Elder Bruce R. McConkie taught in the parable, as here given, the carcass is the body of the church to which the eagles, who are Israel, shall fly to find nourishment. President Dellen H. Oaks discussed how saints today are blessed as they gather in, in stakes throughout the world. With the creation of stakes and the construction of temples in most nations, with sizable populations of the faithful, the current commandment is not to gather to one place, but to gather in stakes in our own homelands. There the faithful can enjoy the full blessings of eternity in the house of the Lord. There, in their own homelands, they can obey the Lord's command to enlarge the borders of his people and strengthen her stakes. In this way, the stakes of Zion are for a defense and for a refuge from the storm and from wrath when it shall be poured out without mixture upon the whole earth. Earthquakes and other natural disasters in various places the Savior's teachings in the scriptures indicate there will be an increase in wars and rumors of wars and also in natural disasters as his second coming approaches. The scriptures also teach that these have a purpose. President Joseph F. Smith explained some of these purposes. We believe that these severe natural calamities are visited upon men by the Lord for the good of his children, to quicken their devotion to others, to bring out their better natures, that they may love and serve him. We believe, further, that there are the heralds and tokens of his final judgment and the schoolmasters to teach the people to prepare themselves by righteous living for the coming of the Savior to reign upon the earth. As Samuel the Lamanite told the people of his day, these events are foretold that ye might know the signs of his coming, to the intent that ye might believe on his name. Iniquity shall abound before the Savior's return. 
Jesus warned that because of the great iniquity of the world, the love of men shall wax cold. This is one of the promised signs of our time. President Ezra Taft Benson declared, We constantly hear or read of wars and rumors of wars. Atheism, agnosticism, immorality, and dishonesty are flaunted in our society. Desertion, cruelty, divorce, and infidelity have become commonplace, leading to a disintegration of the family. Truly, we live in the times of which the Savior spoke, when the love of men shall wax cold, and iniquity shall abound. The Gospel of the Kingdom Preached in All the World Numerous Latter-day scriptures affirm that the in the last days the gospel will go to the four corners of the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Many obstacles must be overcome before that this can happen. However, as President M. Russell Ballard pointed out, these changes may occur quickly. This work is moving. It is beginning to cover the earth. While it is true that many of our Heavenly Father's children have never had the opportunity to hear the message of the Restoration, it is also true that the circumstances preventing them from receiving the Gospel could quickly change. The Sign of the Son of Man The Prophet Joseph Smith stated, Then will appear one grand sign of the Son of Man in heaven. But what will the world do? They will say it is a planet, a comet, etc. But the Son of Man will come as the sign of the coming of the Son of Man, which will be as the light of the morning cometh out of the east. I'm going to read that last sentence one more time because it's kind of redundant and confusing. It says, But the Son of Man will come as the sign of the coming of the Son of Man which will be as the light of the morning coming out of the east. Whoso treasureth up my word shall not be deceived. From the Savior's words, it is evident that placing a high priority on the word of God will be critical in overcoming the deceptions of the last days. Commenting on the scripture passage, Elder Bruce R. McConkie discussed what it means to treasure up the Lord's word. It is not sufficient merely to know what the scriptures say. One must treasure it up, meaning take it into his possession so affirmatively that it becomes a part of his very being. As a consequence, one actually receives the companionship of the Spirit. President Harold B. Lee noted that some church members seek information from unreliable sources concerning the signs that will precede the second coming. He specifically recommended that church members study Matthew 24, Joseph Smith Matthew, and Doctrine and Covenants section 38, 45, 101, and 133. President Lee then stated, These are some of the writings with which you should concern yourselves, rather than commentaries that may, be, that may come from those whose information may not be the most reliable and whose motives may be subject to question. No man knows the time of his coming. Though Jesus has not revealed the time when he will come again, he has used the analogies of the fig tree and a woman in travail, to assure us that we can know when his, when his coming is near. So let's read the woman in travail, 1 Thessalonians 5.3, which says, For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, for they shall not escape. By using the analogy of the fig tree, Jesus refrained from specifying the exact day or the hour when he would return, but he taught that he would return in the season when the promised signs are shown. Commenting on the timing of the second coming of Jesus Christ, President M. Russell Ballard stated, I am called as one of the apostles to be a special witness of Christ in these exciting, trying times, and I do not know when he is going to come again. As far as I know, none of my brethren in the Quorum of the Twelve or even the the First Presidency knows, and I would humbly suggest that if we do not know, then nobody knows. The Savior said that, Of that day and hour no one knoweth, no, not the angels of God in heaven, but my Father only. I believe that when the Lord says no one knows, he really means that no one knows. as it was in the days of Noah. The days of Noah were corrupt before God and filled with violence. Elder Joseph B. Worthen of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles affirmed this comparison between the days of Noah and the last days. In terms of the sin, evil, and wickedness upon the earth, we could liken our time to the days of Noah before the flood. Furthermore, as in the days of Noah, many people will be living 
their everyday lives and ignore the warnings of the prophets and the signs leading up to the destruction of the wicked. One shall be taken and the other left. The Apostle Paul wrote that at the second coming of Jesus Christ, the dead in Christ shall arise, and the saints who are alive upon the earth shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord. On the other hand, all the proud and they that do wickedly will not abide the Lord's coming, which will cleanse the earth by fire. So there's a bunch of references here, and let's read them all. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16-17 says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And there's a JST note for verse 17. I'm just going to reread 17 as the JST, and it says, Then they who are alive shall be caught up together in the clouds with them who remain to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we be ever with the Lord. DNC 2718. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of my spirit, which I will pour out upon you, and my word, which I reveal unto you, and be agreed as touching all things whatsoever ye ask of me. And be faithful until I come, and ye shall be caught up, that where I am, ye shall, also, shall be also. Amen. DNC 76102. Last of all, these all are they who will not be gathered with the saints, to be caught up unto the church of the firstborn and received into the cloud. 8896. And the saints that are upon the earth, who are alive, shall be quickened and be caught up to meet him. And 109.75 that, when the Lord, when, that when the trump shall sound for the dead, we shall be caught up in the cloud to meet thee, that we may ever be with the Lord. And then the next part in the Institute Manual says, On the other hand, all the proud and they that do wickedly will not abide the Lord's coming, which will cleanse the earth by fire. And that references DNC 64.24, which says, For after today cometh the burning. This is speaking after the manner of the Lord. For verily I say, tomorrow all the proud and they that do wickedly shall be as stubble, and I will burn them up, for I am the Lord of hosts. And I will not spare any that remain in Babylon. The next one is Malachi 3 2. But who may abide the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. And Malachi 4 1 says, For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud day, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. And DNC 101, 24 through 25, which says, And every corruptible thing, both of man and, or of the beasts of the field, or of the fowls of the heavens, or of the fish of the sea, that dwells upon all the face of the earth, shall be consumed. And also that of element shall melt with fervent heat, and all things shall become new, that my knowledge and glory may dwell upon all the earth. Being prepared for the second coming. As recorded in Matthew 24, verses 42 through 51, the Savior taught his disciples to be watchful and ready for his coming. In modern revelation, we are told that if we are prepared, we need not fear. President Dallin H. Oaks encouraged us to prepare always for the second coming. Quote, while we are powerless to alter the facts of the second coming and unable to know its exact time, we can accelerate our own preparation and try to influ influence the preparation of those around us. What if the day of his coming were tomorrow? If we knew that we would meet the Lord tomorrow through our premature death or through his unexpected coming, what would we do today? What confessions would we make? What practices would we discontinue? 
What accounts would we settle? What forgivenesses would we extend? What testimonies would we bear? If we would do those things then, why not now? Why not seek peace while peace can be obtained? If our lamps of preparation are drawn down, let us start immediately to replenish them. Three parables of preparation. Now we're getting into Matthew chapter 25. Matthew 25 is a continuation of the Lord's teachings on the Mount of Olives. The three parables in Matthew 25 each teach how to prepare to meet the Lord when he comes again. The ten virgins, the talents, the sheep, and goats. In the ten virgins, the main message is to prepare spiritually for the second coming. For the talents, we are accountable to the Lord for what we have done with spiritual gifts. He will reward us for developing those gifts and the sheep and goats. The Lord will judge each of us. Those who have faithfully served their fellow man will sit on his right hand. Parable of the Ten Virgins The parable of the ten virgins alludes to several Jewish wedding customs. Traditionally, the bridegroom, accompanied by his close friends, would go at night to the bride's house. Following the completion of the wedding ceremonies there, the wedding party would proceed to the groom's house for a feast. Wedding guests who joined the procession were expected to carry their own lamps or torches. The bridegroom in this parable represents the Savior, and his arrival with the wedding procession represents his second coming. The tearing of the bridegroom teaches that the Lord has his own timetable for his second coming. President Dallin H. Oaks spoke about the ten virgins who had been invited to join the wedding party. Quote, the ten virgins obviously represent members of Christ's church, for all were invited to the wedding feast, and all knew what was required to be admitted when the bridegroom came, but only half were ready when he came. Close quote. The oil in this parable represents spiritual preparation. In reference to the parable of the ten virgins, the Lord revealed to the prophet Joseph Smith, And at that day when I shall come in my glory, shall the parable be fulfilled which I spake concerning the ten virgins. For they that are wise, and have received the truth, and have taken the Holy Spirit for their guide, and have not been deceived, verily I say unto you, they shall not be hewn down and cast into the fire, but shall abide the day, and the earth shall be given unto them for an inheritance." President Spencer W. Kimball discussed what the oil symbolizes and why it cannot be shared with those who are foolish. Quote, the kind of oil that is needed to illuminate the way and light up the darkness is not shareable. How can one share obedience to the principle of tithing, a mind at peace from righteous living, an accumulation of knowledge? How can one share faith or testimony? How can one share attitudes or chastity or the experience of a mission? How can one share temple privileges? Each must obtain that kind of oil for himself. In the parable, oil can be purchased at the market. In our lives, the oil of preparedness is accumulated drop by drop in righteous living. Attendance at sacrament meetings adds oil to our lamps drop by drop over the years. Fasting, family prayer, home teaching, control of bodily appetites, preaching the gospel, studying the scriptures, each act of dedication and obedience is a drop added to our store. Deeds of kindness, payment of offerings and tithes, chaste thoughts and actions, marriage and the covenant for eternity, these too contribute importantly to the oil with which we can at midnight refuel or exhaust our exhausted lamps. The dangers of procrastination. Elder Lynn G. Robbins of the Seventy made this obser- observation about why the unwise virgins found the door closed and why they were denied entrance. The closed door is a poignant reminder that this life is the day for men to perform their labors. The fact that the five foolish virgins knocked expecting to enter the marriage supper indicates one of two things. One, they thought they could prepare themselves after the bridegroom came. Or two, knowing that that they at first had not been prepared to enter, they were hoping for mercy. Either way, the door was shut. Close quote. President Henry B. Iring of the First Presidency warned, there is a danger in the world someday when what it means is not this day. Someday I will repent. Someday I will forgive him. Someday I will speak to my friend about the church. Someday I will start to pay tithing. Someday I will, I will return to the temple. Someday 
The scriptures make the danger of delay clear. It is that we may discover that we have run out of time. The parable of the talents. In the Savior's time, a talent was a unit of weight and also a large sum of money. In modern usage, the word talent, as used in this parable, has come to represent any spiritual gift or any skill or ability given to us by God. And the parable teaches that we are responsible to use these gifts wisely and profitably. The second coming is represented by the arrival, after a long time, of a master who had entrusted his servants with talents. The servant who doubled his two talents received the same commendation as the one who doubled his five talents. Each was expected to try to improve on what he had been given. Thus, in the end, only the servant who did nothing with his talent was rejected by his master. President James E. Faust of the First Presidency explained that the Lord will hold all people accountable for what they do with their talents. Some of us are too content with what we may already be doing. We stand back in the eat, drink, and be merry mode when opportunities for growth and development abound. We miss opportunities to build up the kingdom of God because we have the passive notion that someone else will take care of it. The Lord tells us that he will give more to those who are willing. They will be magnified in their efforts. But to, but to those who say, we have enough, from them shall be taken away even that which they have. The Lord entrusts all of his servants, including every priesthood holder, with spiritual talents. While we are not all equal in experience, aptitude, and strength, we have different opportunities to employ these spiritual gifts, and we will all be accountable for the use of the gifts and opportunities given to us. The Parable of the Sheep and the Goats In the Savior's time, sheep and goats typically graze together but they were separated at the end of the day. In this parable, the separating of the sheep and goats represents the judgments that will occur at the Savior's coming. The righteous will receive a place at the, right, the king's right, representing a place of honor and power, and the unrighteous will be assigned to the king's left, representing disfavor. This judgment will largely be based on how well individuals have shown their love for God by caring for others. As in the two previous parables in Matthew 25, the righteous are prepared because of what they have done, while the unrighteous are unprepared because of what they have neglected to do. Referring to the parable of the sheep and the goats, Elder Joseph B. Worthland te testified, At the final day, the Savior will not ask about the nature of our callings. He will not inquire about our material possessions or fame. He will ask if we ministered to the sick, gave food and drink to the hungry, visited those in prison, or gave succor to the weak. When we reach out to assist the least of Heavenly Father's children, we do it unto Him. That is the essence of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay, so that's the end of Matthew 24 and 25. And the next part, we'll read Mark 12 and 13. The Two Great Commandments. Mark 12, 28-34 records the answer Jesus gave to a scribe who asked him which of the first or greatest commandment. In his response, the Savior quoted two Old Testament passages. First, he cited Deuteronomy 6, 4-5. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. The opening phrase from the prayer called the Shema, which is recited twice each day by observant Jews, begins with the words from verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, affirming that God is the only one worthy of worship and devotion. The Savior then cited Leviticus 19.18, which says, Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, making clear that this is the second great commandment. To read more about the two great commandments, see the commentary for Matthew 22. I think we did that last week. The Poor Widow's Mites 
The mites the widow donated to the temple treasury were small Jewish coins called lepta, Greek for small. They weighed about half a gram, less than one-fiftieth of an ounce, and were worth less than a farthing, or quadrant, which was the Roman coin of lowest value at the time. The fact that the widow gave all that she had exemplified her sincere devotion to God in contrast to the pretense of the scribes. Elder James E. Talmadge of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained why the Lord commended the widow even though her offering was a relatively small donation. The rich gave much, yet kept back more. The widow's gift was her all. It was not the smallest of her offering that made it especially acceptable, but the spirit of sacrifice and devout intent with which she gave. Elder Talmadge also stated, whether it be the gift of a man or a nation, the best if offered willingly and with pure intent, is always excellent in the sight of God, however poor by other comparison that best may be. Conspiracies against Jesus Christ From the beginning of the Savior's ministry, politicians in positions of power felt that their power... Oh, this is getting into Mark 14. So, we're done with that. Okay. And, uh... The next part is Luke 21, which is the same as Matthew 24, more or less. So I'm guessing it's going to just refer us back to that other chapter. Okay, here we are, Luke 21. Nope, there's quite a bit to read here. In your patience possesses ye your souls. President Dieter F. Uchtdorf of the First Presidency taught about the meaning of Luke 21.19, Patience is a process of perfection. The Savior himself said that in your patience you possess your souls. Or, to use another translation of the Greek text, in your patience you win mastery of your souls. Patience means to abide in faith, knowing that sometimes it is in the waiting rather than in the receiving that we grow the most. This was true in the time of the Savior. It is true in our time as well, for we are commanded in these latter days to continue in patience until ye are perfected. Until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Luke 21:24 is the only place where the phrase times of the Gentiles appears in the Bible. The phrase also appears three times in Latter-day Revelation in D&C 45, verses 25, 28, and 30. In New Testament times, the gospel was preached first to Jews and then to Gentiles, according to Romans 1.16. In the latter days, the message of the restored gospel is to go first to Gentile nations and then to the Jews. The period of time when the Gentiles have precedence in receiving the gospel is called the times of the Gentiles. President Joseph Fielding Smith stated, The times of the Gentiles commence shortly after the death of our Redeemer. The Jews soon rejected the gospel, and it was then taken to the Gentiles. The times of the Gentiles have continued from that time until now. President Smith spoke further about the fulfillment of the times of the Gentiles. Quote, Jesus said the Jews would be scattered among all nations, and Jerusalem would be trodden down by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles were fulfilled. The prophecy in section 45, verses 25 or verses 24 through 29 of the Doctrine and Covenants regarding the Jews, was literally fulfilled. Jerusalem, which was trodden down by the Gentiles, is no longer trodden down, but is made the home of the Jews. They are returning to Palestine, and by this we may know that the times of the Gentiles are near their close. So let's read DNC 45, 24 through 29. And this one refers to 30 also. So we'll read um, 24 through 30. Oops, too far down. Okay. And this I have told you concerning Jerusalem. And when that day shall come, shall a remnant be scattered among all nations. But they shall be gathered again. But they shall remain until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And in that day shall be heard of wars and rumors of wars, and the whole earth shall be in commotion, and men's hearts shall fail them, and they shall say that Christ delayeth his coming until the end of the earth. 
and the love of men shall wax cold, and iniquity shall abound. And when the times of the Gentiles is come in, a light shall break forth among them that sit in darkness, and it shall be the fullness of my gospel. But they receive it not, for they perceive not the light. And they turn their hearts from me because of the precepts of men. And in that generation shall the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life. Many of the Savior's teachings about the destruction of Jerusalem and the second coming found in Luke 21 are also found in Matthew 23 or Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Joseph Smith Matthew. However, only Luke recorded the Savior's warning that if people were overcharged or weighed down with suffeting, which is overindulgence of appetites and drunkenness and cares of this life, anxieties and stresses, they would not be prepared for his second coming. This warning about self-indulgence and drunkenness in the last days is similar to the Savior's declaration that the last days would be as the days of Noah, when people were eating and drinking and knew not until the flood came. To protect saints in the latter days, the Lord revealed the word of wisdom, including the commandment to abstain from alcohol and harmful drugs. Obeying this commandment not only benefits our physical health, but also helps us be spiritually prepared to meet the Savior. President Dieter F. Uchtdorf taught how we can avoid being overwhelmed by the anxieties and stresses of life. He said that those who are wise resist the temptation to get caught up in the frantic rush of everyday life. They follow the advice, there is more to life than increasing its speed, in short, they focus on the things that matter most. Teaching in the Temple Many verses in the four Gospels attest that Jesus frequently taught in the Temple. During the final week of his mortal existence, while he was in Jerusalem, he taught daily in the Temple. This pattern of teaching in the Temple was continued by Jesus' disciples after he ascended into heaven. In this matter, like all others, Jesus is our perfect example. That's the end. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up so that YouTube knows to share it with others. And uh, leave a comment just saying that you liked it or tell me what you had for breakfast or something. And that helps the algorithm to know that people are engaging with the material and more people can benefit from this message. I hope you have a great day. Thanks. Bye.